Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I wanna cover the technical network engineering interview. So let's get this started. We got the suit and no tie ready to go. Um, I would love to just share with you guys how to answer technical network engineering questions because a lot of people, they go into network engineering interviews and they're not able to answer these technical network engineering questions and they really struggle in it and it prevents them from really landing a position because you're not able to elaborate in the most correct manner. So I'm gonna go ahead and have a list of network engineering questions here and I'm gonna go ahead and answer them for you in the most viable manner that's gonna help you land a job as quick as possible. So let's go ahead and jump in. So I got the first question here and let's go ahead and listen to it. How does DHCP work? And have you used this before in your experience? Yes, so we have, I have used DHCP many times over. So I use this protocol mainly for being able to, first of all, DHCP, the whole purpose of it, what it does is it automatically assigns IP addresses to end devices on a local area network. So to kind of elaborate more on what I mean by this is, let's say you're in an office environment or a coffee shop and you walk into the coffee shop, you have your laptop with you, you're trying to get some work done and you connect into the Wi-Fi of the coffee shop's network. And once you connect into that Wi-Fi, instead of having to statically add an IP address into the local area network, of that device, or sorry, into the local area network of that router, it will automatically assign a IP address for you that is available from the pool of addresses that is assigned, that's automatically created. So it basically auto assigns an IP address to a device on the network. So it's a really cool protocol. And this protocol without it, I mean, it would be an absolute headache for people to manually configure an IP address or a static IP address, especially since there are many reusable private IP addresses that are just giving me a headache for people to have to deal with. So it's a really cool protocol. It uses the DCP uses um, a four step process known as Dora, right? So that's the easy way to remember it, Dora the Explorer. But the process goes by discover. So it sends a discover message out and that's going to be to send a message um, from the end device is going to send a message out to find its server because the DHCP addresses are going to be hosted on the server. So the end device, as soon as you enable GCP, it's going to send a broadcast message out to all the end devices on the network and or all the all the devices on the network to be able to find that server. And once it finds the server, it's going to send that offer. And that offer message is going to be sent back to the end device saying, hey, you know, I am the server. What do you need? And then the, the then it's going to send a request message from the end device. That end device is going to send that request message back to the server saying, hey, I need an IP address. And then it's going to acknowledge that and send you an IP address. So it's a really cool process. It's a four-step process. And DCP is an awesome protocol to work with. And it's a protocol that I've used many times over in my in my current role because we have multiple end devices in our current team. And for us to be able to function, we need DCP to, to be configured. And it's a really simple protocol. It works with V4 and V6. And we use this multiple times over and it's a great protocol to work with. So that's what dynamic host configuration protocol is. It's a really cool protocol to work with. And I've never seen a network engineer not know what this is. So um, out of curiosity, are you guys using DHCP yourself um, in your in your guys' network? Is it more of an end device self? And uh, like, uh, you guys troubleshoot it often. So kind of elaborate that for me. So as you can see, I was able to answer the question. I just didn't say, oh, DHCP stands for dynamic host configuration. You no, know, I went and explained what it does and how I used it. And I gave some examples and I gave the door process and all that stuff. That's really important for you guys to do because during these technical interviews, they gauge your level of understanding based off how well you answer the question. If you just say, if you just, and here's the thing when it comes to these, these protocols, never say what it stands for. It's never going to do you any justice. It's, and it's not an answer. Okay. Just like if you say, what's the NFL, you say it's the national football league. What does that mean? Explain it. Okay. I don't know if you explain it, like explain it to me like a dummy. Don't explain what it stands for ever. Go into the weeds of it. So that's kind of how I would answer that question. So let's go ahead and move on to the next question. All right. So we have the next question here. Let's go, let's go ahead and listen to it. What is the difference between TCP and UDP? Awesome. So yeah, there are some differences between these two layer four protocols. The main difference I would like to bring up real quick is what each protocol, what its best use case is it for? So TCP is mainly used for connection oriented connections that you're trying to create. So for example, you're doing a you know website browsing, you're trying to connect to a website and to connect to that website, you're going to have to use TCP because it is a lot more secure and it's a lot more stable as opposed to using UDP, which is really focused on sending connections out extremely quick and it doesn't resend connections. So it's mainly used for phone calls, video calls, and we're having a video call right now if you're watching this YouTube video. Um, but if you're on an interview, I'm pretty sure you're on a web call. And during the interview, you can say like, hey, this particular call is using UDP packets because it's fast, it's efficient, and it's sent right away, right? So that's kind of the, the two main differences. They work on the layer four the, of the OSI model. And the these two protocols, they go intertwined. It really depends on what you're using. But if you're looking for something quick, like a phone call or, or online gaming or streaming, 
UDP. If you're looking for something more connection oriented like web browsing or, or connecting, to, you know, something that's more secure, like connecting to a bank account, TCP 100%. And TCP also has a handshake, right? So it has a three way handshake as well. That's part of the, the process like sync, act, act, sync, um, acknowledge. So that's kind of the process for the TCP as well. So it, it's a lot more time sensitive or takes more time for TCP, but is more stable and it's more connection oriented. So those are the two main differences of TCP and UDP. So that's kind of how to answer that question, right? I'm not going to say what it stands for. I don't even know what UDP stands for. I think it's user data ground protocol and TCP is like transmission control protocol. What it stands for doesn't matter. What matters is what it does. So that's kind of what I what I did there right there. So let's go on to the next question. So we have the next question here. Let's go ahead and listen. What are the layers of the OSI model? And what happens at each layer? Yeah, so the OSI model, the OSI model has seven layers and I'm gonna start off by the bottom going into the top. So the first layer of the OSI model is known as the physical layer. The physical layer is basically anything physical that we touch as a network engineer, the wires, cables, even radio frequencies and the routers and access points. So it's all the physical stuff that we deal with as an engineer. Going into layer two, this is where that physical stuff finally turns into actual data, right? So it's a phenomenal process that goes into term that becomes that. But that in that point, we this is where MAC addressing is found. This is where those light waves that we have in layer one are turning to data. So that's kind of like the, the process for layer two. Going to layer three, that's kind of where it, it we it goes into IP addressing. So this is the network layer of the OSI model. This is where we have IP addressing. This is where we have routing. And every time we go up a, a layer in the OSI model, it actually gets more intelligent. Going into layer four, this is where is known as the transport layer. This is how data is being transported. How is it being sent? Is it going to use TCP as we mentioned? Is it going to use UDP? Which which protocol is it going to use? What port number is it going to use? It, 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 it decides on how it's going to be transmitted, right? Going into the next layer, it's known as the session layer. The session layer basically decides how are we going to establish a session on the OSI model, right? So this is, or on a network, right? Like what type of session we're gonna use? Going into the next layer is called the presentation layer. The presentation layer decides on how is the data gonna be presented? Are we use JPEG? Are we gonna use video, M like MPG? How are we going to show the data? Going into layer seven, which is the final layer, it's known as the application layer. This is the layer where, uh, this is the final layer of the OSI model. This is kind of like where we will use protocols like HTTPS, this is where we use protocols like DNS, and this is how we actually get the to, to, to use the application, okay? so. As a network engineer, we mainly focus on layers one through four, really, but layers five through seven, we don't really deal with ourselves. And to be honest, I don't really know much about layer five and six as much as often, but it's kind of the, the layers of the OSI model. So. so that's kind of how to answer it. There's one thing I made a mistake on. I should not have said, downsold myself and said, I don't really know much about five and six. That's kind of like too much information to give. It, it's only going to hurt you saying that as opposed to helping you. So I should never said that during the So, but just like I said, I make mistakes too. So that's a mistake I made there. So let's go on to the next question. What's the purpose of a default gateway? Yeah. So a default gateway is basically like the door of a network. So when it comes to a local area network, um, there are usually private IP addresses within that local area network. And maybe, maybe you're trying to connect to someone outside of that network. It's almost like a house. You, you have all these rooms in the house that all can, can communicate with each other. But if you want to talk to someone outside of your house, you have to leave that front door. And that's kind of what the default network is. It's going to be anything that doesn't match any particular IP address on that particular network, it's going to go to that default network, which is like, hey, this is the front door, get out. <laughs> so that's kind of what the default network is. It's kind of a, like I said, the front door of a network and it's it uses the IP address 0.0.0.0, .0 to match it. Um, you would use like an IP route command for that. And uh, it's a really cool command. And it's a whole the whole process of doing this is any device that doesn't match the IP address of a device on that particular network, it's going to go out that default router. So most likely if you're connecting on your home network, you will have a default route out to your internet device, which will, will eventually get to the internet. So that's kind of what a default route is or default gateway is rather. Um, if you don't mind me asking, do you guys use uh, default gateways in your current network? Like what's the process in your, your guys' side? So, this, so that's kind of how I'd answer that particular question. Um, like I said, very, keep it very brief. Uh, but also show that you know what you're talking about. And after some time, you're gonna do extremely well. So let's do one, let's do one more. So let me just go and look for one more right here. All right, so this is the last question. So let's go ahead and listen to it and, and let's go and answer. What is NAT and when would you use it? Yeah, so what is NAT? So basically the whole purpose of NAT is to translate a private IP address into a public IP address. And the whole reason we have this protocol and the reason why we even have it in general is there is a certain number of pri just IPv4 addresses and we ran out of IPv4 addresses. So there was a clever way to sort of um, save as much IP addresses in that pool that we have currently, right? There's only 4.3 billion IP ad IPv4 addresses. So with NAT, the whole purpose of what it will do is 
it will convert those private IP addresses into a public IP address, right? And once it does that, the whole point of, of, of doing that, that shift is to, is to turn multiple private IP addresses into a public address. And that's the whole purpose of that. It will translate an IP address into a public IP address. And the public IP address then in turn can be used to route throughout the internet because those private IP addresses can only stay within that local area network, unfortunately. So that's kind of the whole purpose of that. And obviously when it comes back to you, it'll translate that private IP address, or sorry, that public IP address from the internet and turn it into that private address that will be sent to that end device. So it's a really cool protocol. There's multiple parts of it. There's dynamic now, there's PAT, and uh, it's a really cool protocol to work with. And if you don't want me asking, like, are you guys using a lot of NAT, your guys' a team? I mean, I, I've, in my current role, we don't really use it as often. Um, or I'm not really part of that particular team, but I'm, I'm curious to see if you guys are using that pretty often on your side. So that's kind of how I would answer that question when it comes to, to NAT. So like I said, I didn't say it's just network address translation and then end of day. If you say that, you're not gonna be able to answer the question. So that's kind of how I would answer it. It's a very simple question with, you wanna keep it a very simple answer and maybe ask a follow-up question at the end to kind of make it seem like you know what you're talking about and to, to put a, little, a lot less pressure on you to answer that question. So that's kind of how I would answer technical network engineering questions. So as a network engineer, you have to remember there are the technical side and then you know the, the behavioral side. The technical side is the hardest side, but it does require practice and like I said, I've been practicing for a while and you should be practicing and you should use this as practice. So speak it out loud. Don't just do the technical knowledge, speak the technical knowledge out loud. That way, once you actually do it in real life, it's gonna be extremely easy, right? So go ahead and knock it out. Hopefully this has been an informative video for you guys. If you guys like this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe. You can wanna see more, comment if you have any questions. If you guys want more mentorship and want to land a job in tech as a network engineer in under six months, go ahead and click the link down below and I'll show you exactly how to do that. And you can just go and click that link down below. But with that being said, everyone, I really do appreciate you guys' time and I hope you guys have a good rest of your day and peace.